Good evening, everyone. Hi, I'm Amy Johnson Crow, and this evening we are going to do a little wrap up of the biggest news in genealogy for 2022 and what a year it was. Oh my goodness, between new collections being added and websites changing and just all sorts of cool things, DNA, all sorts of neat stuff, there's a lot to cover. And I think sometimes it's easy to forget all of the things that have happened in the past year. And sometimes things that happened at the beginning of the year, sometimes by the time it rolls around to December, we've kind of forgotten about them and maybe we haven't explored those items as much as we should have. And we might still have some discoveries that we could be making in those new collections, those updated collections, and how they've changed different things around. So I, I am so thankful that you are joining me, whether you're watching this live or watching the replay, I really do appreciate you being here. So let's go ahead and dive right into what we had going on in genealogy and family history in 2022. I see some, some people popping in, have, have Beth from Montreal. Jennifer is from my home state of Ohio. Millicent is watching from St. Clair County, Michigan. Denise is in DC. All right, well, like I said, we've got a lot to cover, so let's dive right in. Hopefully I will be able to share the little notes that I put together. There we go. Hello there, Susan in Missouri. Well, probably the biggest news in genealogy, at least in the United States, in 2022 was the release of the 1950 U.S. Census. And if you've been watching me on YouTube this year, you might recall that back on April 1st, when this was, this was first released, um, I did a live stream then and we dove right into the 1950 census as soon as it became live at midnight on April 1st. And they say genealogists don't know how to party. We know how to party. <laughs> we have a good time with things like the release of the U.S. Census. So the, um, with, the, with the U.S. Census, it it's taken every 10 years and there's a 72 year waiting period. So the most recent one that we have available is the 1950 census. As I said a moment ago, it became available publicly April 1st of this year. And it's a really, really interesting snapshot of our families at that point in time. There are some questions on here that's just really fun. And one thing that I wanna point out as we've been playing around with the census since it was released and we're seeing more of what we can find in it, one thing that I've been absolutely fascinated by, let's see if I can zoom in on this just a little bit. Here, let's, let's try this. Is the 1950 census was the first time that the Census Bureau, which is the organization, the agency that's responsible for administering the, the census, the Census Bureau actually encouraged the enumerators to make notes. So when something was maybe a little odd or something what couldn't be quite explained just in the space that was provided for all of the little, you know, the little spaces for all of the questions, um, they were actually encouraged to make notes on the census form. And there were a couple places that these notes could appear. On this particular page that I'm showing, the notes are at the bottom of the page. On other census pages, the notes are at the top of the page, above where all of the names start. Now, I actually did a video showing where to find the notes and how to match those notes to the people that are listed on that census page. So. Um, you might want to check out that video. It's over on my YouTube channel. So if you're watching this video over on Facebook, pop on over to my YouTube channel and you will find a video talking all about these special notes that are in the 1950 census. Now, there was one I was looking at just earlier today that was talking about 
it enumerated a woman. She was in her early 20s, and her occupation was listed as a clerk at the city hospital. But there was a note saying that what she was doing was recording the diets of the patients for the dietary department. Now, admittedly, that's not something that you're probably going to you know, fit on a, on a family group sheet or on an ancestor chart, but it's a little bit more detail about what she was actually doing. Yeah, she's working as a clerk, but here's exactly what she was doing. She was actually recording the patient's diets for the dietary department. Again, it's not like it gave me mother's maiden name, but it's a cool little detail. And I think that that's been the neatest thing about exploring the 1950 census is getting those details about our ancestors, about our relatives, and just kind of, you know, as, as the saying goes, kind of putting the, the meat on the bones. So our ancestors are more than just their names and they're more than just dates and places. So I think anytime we can pull out a cool little detail like that, hey, I think that that's a record worth exploring. Now, the 1950 census is available for free on the National Archives website. It's available for free on FamilySearch. It's also still currently free on Ancestry and MyHeritage. So you have a lot of options on where you can go and explore the 1950 census. The interesting thing about the National Archives website, they used their own program to run sort of handwriting recognition against the census. So they created their own index. Ancestry and FamilySearch worked together. Ancestry did the first pass with their own version of handwriting recognition software. And then they gave that data over to FamilySearch. FamilySearch then put it as part of a community indexing project and volunteers all around the world worked on comparing what was on the census to what that index, that preliminary index from Ancestry said, and then made corrections. I was actually astonished how accurate the preliminary index that was on Ancestry and that FamilySearch was working from, I was really astonished how accurate it was. I was that was something that was not really possible 10 years ago when we released the 1940 census. I was part of the consortium that worked on the, the planning of the community indexing for the 1940 census. And we had thought about actually doing handwriting recognition back then, but it wasn't anywhere close to being accurate enough for people to really use. I mean, yeah, it was possible to do it, but it wasn't really usable. And if it's not usable, what's the point? So it's been mind boggling to me how far we've come just in 10 years with that ability to be able to run a software program against handwriting and have it come back to be something even remotely usable. It's just absolutely blown my mind. Let's see, we've got, oh, we have, we have Stella from New Zealand. Fun, we have people from California and Arkansas. Have Diana from Missouri. Jennifer says, Jennifer says, that was so fun. I think you're, are you referring to the live stream that we did back when the census was released? That was a lot of fun. We had, we had balloons and we had party hats and we just had a good time. <laughs> like I said, they say that genealogists don't know how to party. Hey, <laughs> just give us a brand new census. We will party. Chris is in New Hampshire. Thanks for joining me tonight, Chris. Yeah, and Chris says, um, I had to correct a few spelling errors in the census. <laughs> yeah, and that's been the, the cool thing that on Family Search with the community indexing, really was community review, um, going in and correcting some of those 
handwriting errors because even as good as the handwriting recognition software was, hey, it's not 100%. So we could go in and make those corrections and we can still go in and make corrections now. If you are on Family Search and you find a 1950 census record that, yeah, it still isn't spelled quite right, you can still go in and submit a correction. You can submit a correction on Ancestry. You can submit a correction on the National Archives website if you want to. So, um, yeah, all, all sorts of options. But I love how, really, how accurate it is. It's just, it, it blows my mind. Absolutely blows my mind. Diana says, the 1950 census was an eye-opener to me, and I totally didn't expect to learn anything new. <laughs> you know, I had the same thing, Diana. Um, I had, it was it was actually kind of, I, I was kind of emotional when I found it. When I found my dad living with my grandparents, and I, I knew where he was living. I, I knew where they were living, although it was fun to look for them because, their house was at an intersection where literally three different enumeration districts came together. So it's like, which one do I look in? Um, and this was in Franklin County, Ohio. And Franklin County was part of a trial program, part of a, part of a pilot program with a few other counties in Ohio, a handful of counties in Michigan, where it used a completely different form. And instead of the enumerator writing everything out, someone in the household filled it out. And like I said, I knew where my grandparents and where my dad, where they were living in 1950. I was, I was actually quite pleased with myself that I guessed the correct enumeration district on the first try. You know, hey, yay me. Um, <laughs> I had a one out of three chance, right? Because um, I... I didn't want to wait for the index. And then I also discovered that because this, because of the census in Franklin County, Ohio, and these other pilot counties, um, because they used a completely different form, they were going to be indexed later. So I would have had to have waited a you know much longer time to look for dad and grandma and grandpa. But what was so emotional to me when I found it. And there was really nothing new in there. I mean, yeah, a couple little details. You know, I didn't know exactly where, where grandpa was working at the time because I didn't know when he changed jobs. But what I discovered, and I'm so thankful for, as soon as I found that page, and I'm just going through this enumeration district page after page after page, you know, looking for my grandparents, looking for my dad, I didn't even have to read the name at the top of the form. As soon as I saw the handwriting, I knew it was them. My dad was the one who filled out the census. I recognized his handwriting immediately. And then I thought about it for a moment. It's like, wait a minute, am I really reading this? Am I reading too much into this? You know, maybe that really isn't dad's handwriting. But then I sent a copy to both of my sisters and they're like, yeah, that's dad's. <laughs> that's dad's handwriting. So that, that was really cool. That was really cool. So Cecile says, I still haven't found my dad. He should be living in a frat house in Chicago while in college at Illinois Tech. Yeah, and that's something interesting, Cecile, that for the first time that college students who were living um, at college, you know, they were away at college, they were supposed to be enumerated at college. So he should be enumerated in that in that frat house. Um, in previous censuses, like 1940, college students, even if they were living away from home, they were supposed to be enumerated at their normal residence. So they were still supposed to be enumerated back home with mom and dad. So, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, Laura says, the census taker did not count my great-grandmother in the census. She died April 5th. 
and really should have been listed as being alive on April 1st. Yeah, that's that's right, Laura. It was They were supposed to count everyone who was living as of April 1st. And sometimes either the census taker didn't understand that right or the person giving the answers didn't understand it quite right. I was researching someone a couple weeks ago and I was trying to find them in the household with their parents and doing a little bit more research discovered that they weren't born until April 30th. It's like really <laughs> missed it by that much. Yeah. Missed it by that much. Yeah. Thanks, Cynthia. It, it was, I was pretty emotional when I found it. It was, it was pretty cool. I have to admit. Yeah. All right. So that was, like I said, the biggest news, at least in the United States, when it comes to genealogy in 2022, which was the 1950 census. Um, again, here on my, on my YouTube channel, I do have a video that talks about um, using those enumerator notes. So you might want to take a look for that. But that's not the only thing that happened in 2022. We had other things as well, including an update, and I talked about this in October when Ancestry first did this, and this was their brand new, what they call Side View with Ancestry DNA. Now, when Side View first launched, it was a way of taking your Ancestry DNA ethnicity estimate and splitting that ethnicity estimate into parent one and parent two, which some people, parent one was their father's side, and some people, uh, parent two was their father's side. So it, it varies, okay? Um, you do have to go into your own ancestry DNA results and figure out which of your parents is parent one and which one's parent two, because it's not the same for everybody. But when, they, when ancestry DNA first launched SideView, it was a way of taking your ethnicity estimate and saying, okay, it looks like this much of your Irish ancestry comes from parent one, only this much comes from parent two, but oh, by the way, you know, all of your uh, Welsh ancestry seems to come from parent two and you didn't get any of that from parent one. And that was kind of, kind of interesting, kind of useful. It was very useful to some people if they had parents who had vastly different ethnicity estimates. And then it was just kind of a way to, you know, really separate that out. But where it really came in handy was this fall when they expanded side view to not include not only the ethnicity estimate, but actually separate our matches. So they, they say that for nine people out of 10, that it's 95% accurate. So for 90% of us, the matches that you see, it's 95% accurate which side they put that match on. And you can see here on the screen, I'll go in a little bit, a little bit closer, that for me, I have 21,000 matches who are assigned to my parent one, and about 23,000 who are assigned as a match on my parent two. So yeah, that's, that's kind of useful where it has been very useful for me personally is a project I've been working on trying to help an adoptee. Now we've already identified the biological mother, but we have no idea about the biological father. So being able to go into those matches and I can see which one, I, I figure out who is parent one and who is parent two in terms of maternal and paternal sides of the family. So if I want to concentrate just on that biological father side of the family, in that case, I, I think hers was parent one was the paternal side. So if I want to be concentrating on those, and really digging in and analyzing just those matches, I can filter it down 
to look just at the matches for the paternal side of the family. That has been a game changer in terms of going in and being able to effectively analyze all of these matches. So that if you haven't gone, if you've taken an ancestry DNA test and you haven't gone in and looked at your matches recently, I encourage you to go take a look because if you haven't looked at them for a while, it could be a lot different. Um, again, seeing the, the side view of the paternal matches, the maternal matches, you will have some matches that are what they call unassigned. They can't quite tell which side of the family those matches are on. And you will probably have a few that are matches on both sides, especially if your ancestors, if, if your family's from both sides of your family, were in close proximity to each other. Now, remember I said a moment ago that Ancestry estimates that for 90% of people that this splitting is going to be 95% accurate. But that means that for about 10% of people, it's going to be less than 95% accurate. And in some cases, it's going to be way less than 95%. If you have in, in your family, family tree, if you have an endogamous population, so if you have Jewish ancestry, if you have uh, French Canadian ancestry, if you have, if you come from any, um, if, if you have any descent from a community where there is a lot of intermarriage and you could be related to someone through multiple lines, just because the families have, have intermarried so often, um, the side view is not going to be nearly as helpful. So I, I will say that. But if you, haven't, um, if you haven't taken a look at that, I really encourage you to do so. Of course, also with Ancestry DNA in the past year, they have had updates to their ethnicity estimates, as well as to the genetic communities. I really like the genetic communities because the ethnicity estimate is really looking at your way far back ancestry, all right? It's kind of taking people from current populations and trying to extrapolate where those populations came from way, 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 way back, all right? And you might not have actually followed your paper trail that far back to, you know, for it to really make sense. On the other hand, the genetic communities are based on much, much more recent generations. So that, um, that adoptee that I've been helping, she has a very strong genetic community and I can go in and I've been able to determine that that very strong genetic community is actually on her father's side. So now I can go even more in depth with those particular matches and say, okay, I can see that these matches are on her father's side and these matches are all coming from the same community. I can dig more deeply into that. I, I can prioritize my time and start with those and take a deeper dive into those. So it's been really, really fascinating seeing the changes and the updates that Ancestry has been making to the DNA, both to the ethnicity estimates and to the genetic communities. I know a lot of people get confused when Ancestry does roll out a new ethnicity estimate, but I want to remind people it's called an ethnicity estimate for a reason. The science, your, your DNA does not change, but how we understand it can change. And the algorithms that they can put into place to try to determine the ethnicity estimate, that definitely changes as science gets better. Right? It's not just handwriting recognition software that gets better over the last 10 years. It's amazing what they have been able to really discover with DNA. So 
don't be surprised, don't be alarmed when your ethnicity estimate changes because it will change. That's just how it is. Again, your DNA stays the same, but how we understand how to read it, how to interpret what it's really saying about our origins, that part changes. So that's, yeah. Millicent says, um, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, Millicent says, uh, I've been a member of Ancestry for seven years and yes, I've noticed that to be the case. Um, oh, I think she's referring to, to what Jennifer said in the comments. I'm wondering if the number of DNA matches will have a growth spurt from people getting a DNA test as a Christmas gift. Yeah, that is often the case. So, and also if you are sending in a DNA kit right now, you're probably going to have a longer wait time because all of the testing companies all had sales right before Christmas. So now everybody has brand new kits and everybody's sending them in all at the same time. So it usually takes a little bit longer to get your results, but start looking like late February, March, you'll probably start seeing more matches popping up both on Ancestry DNA and other testing sites as well. Mm, excuse me. So that was that was the big thing in Ancestry DNA, really that side view. Very, very cool. If you haven't looked at it, go explore it. I, th I think that you will like what you see there. And speaking of liking things, if you are liking this recap, if you're getting value from it, go ahead and hit that like button, whether you're watching this on YouTube or watching it over on Facebook, go ahead and hit that like button. If you're watching this on YouTube and you wanna stay up to date with the videos that, that I'm doing over here about genealogy and family history, feel free to also hit that subscribe button so you can stay up to date with all of the videos that I'm going to be publishing. Got some fun ones. Fun ones coming out here pretty soon. So that should that should be fun. All right, moving on to our next bit of genealogy news for 2022. And that that's the updates that Family Search has been making. Oh my goodness. And first, thank you, Family Search, for putting together such a wonderful press release with great graphics. I like that. <laughs> I can add wonderful graphics thanks to the wonderful people at Family Search. So, Family Search, I know a lot of people still have a misconception about Family Search. They think it's it's just the tree. That that great big tree that, you know, there's a gajillion people in it and it's all one big combined tree. And people hear that and they don't realize how much else family search has and so they don't use family search because oh my gosh it's the you know that tree family search as of right now they have almost 17 billion that's billion with a b records and images from around the world and you know what they're all free yeah, you need to create an account. The account is free. But to have this resource of nearly 17 billion records and images, wow, yeah, I think that's something that we all need to explore. Oh my goodness. They added, FamilySearch added nearly 2 billion records and images to FamilySearch.org just in 2022. Like I said, bringing their total up to almost 17 billion. That's just mind boggling. Now I see, <laughs> thanks Chris, yes, mash that like button. <laughs> yeah, sometimes, sometimes you do have to go to a, a family history center um, or an affiliate of a family search affiliate library. And that's that's not something that family search has as a requirement. 
FamilySearch makes these records available through agreements with the different record holders. So sometimes you'll have an archive or a government agency and they'll say, yeah, we're cool with you presenting these images, but we don't want them to be just out there everywhere. We would rather they just be available within a family history center or an affiliate library. Fortunately for us as researchers, more and more public libraries, university libraries, special libraries, what have you, um, more and more libraries are becoming family search affiliates. I know my local library is a family search affiliate. So when I'm doing some research on family search and I'm going through and I'm finding some, some great records and I go to click to see the image and this, this little message pops up and it says, oh, you know, access is restricted to family history centers or family search affiliate libraries. It's like, okay, not a problem. You know, I, I guess I will have to put shoes on rather than, you know, just wearing my, my fuzzy bunny slippers. <laughs> it's not very safe to drive with fuzzy bunny slippers, just saying. So I do have to put shoes on and drive to the library. But I tell you, it's a lot easier to do that than to go across the country to wherever that government agency was or that archive was and go and try to find the records there. So if you haven't, um, if, if you've been exploring family search and you've come across that, that little pop up that says, sorry, this, this image is restricted to only family history centers or affiliate libraries, check with your local library and see if they are a family search affiliate. You might be surprised because they are really adding them. Yeah. All right. So not only do we have the nearly 17 billion records and images on family search with 2 billion added just this year, another section of the family search website is the digital books. It's one of the most underutilized sections of family search, but they have more than 555,000 digital books in the family search digital book collection. Now these could be family histories, they might be county histories, they could be business histories, they could be abstracted records. I mean, it's, it's just endless the type of books that they could have there in the digital book collection. And just this year, they added another 19,000 books, bringing the total, as, as you see there on the screen, to 555,009 digital books, just, you know, a total this year with 19,000 added. So again, if that's a section of the Family Search website that you haven't explored for a while, you might want to go back and check it again because you never know what has been added. That's a source that you want to keep checking periodically. Again, that's the Family Search Digital Books. Now, something else that you will want to go back and search on a regular basis is something called the Periodical Source Index or PERSI. Now, the reason that I have this here in the 2022 recap is for the first time, the Periodical Source Index is being hosted by the creator of the Periodical Source Index, and that is the Genealogy Center at the Allen County Public Library in Fort Wayne, Indiana. They started putting together the Periodical Source Index, or PERSI. Oh, I should know the year off the top of my head. Um, it was in the 1980s, I think it was. And when, well, it was so long ago that when they first started putting Percy together, they arranged it so that it would be one line, it would be one record on one line. And it had to fit on an old dot matrix printer. Yeah. So it's been around a while. So what PERSI is, if you're not familiar with the periodical source index, 
it's not the same as what you're probably envisioning, like those green books that we used to use when we were writing term papers back in school. And we would look up a subject and it would tell us, you know, let's say that you're researching, I don't know, um, the history of the, you know, Coca-Cola company. This live stream is not sponsored by Coca-Cola Zero Cherry. It's not. But Coca-Cola, if you do want to sponsor future live streams, hey, let me know. Um, but if you were doing a, a term paper on the history of the Coca-Cola company, you would look it up in those green books and it would tell you, you know, whatever periodical it had articles about it. This is not those same books. That was the Reader's Guide to Periodical Literature. But this is the same concept. It's a, it's a subject index of genealogy and local history periodicals. Now, most of them are published in the United States, but they have a large number from Canada, the British Isles, and lots of other countries as well. The, and, and if you're wondering why does the Genealogy Center at the Allen County Public Library put this together, they have the largest collection of these periodicals. So they were getting in all of these periodicals and they're realizing, wait a minute, there's some really, really cool stuff in here, but sometimes these things are published in places you wouldn't expect, like the family Bible that ends up on the other side of the country from where you expected it because, you know, some descendant of another line ended up with the Bible. The family started in Virginia, but the descendants in California, so it gets published in a California periodical. That's the cool thing about Percy, that you can use it as a subject index for all of these periodicals. And they have just released this on their website back in January, and they've already updated it twice since then. And right now it has more than 3 million records. So it's definitely worth exploring. I do wanna show you just a, a quick, so I did a search earlier this evening, just looking for Marion County, West Virginia school records. And there's 23 articles. Now, Again, this is a subject index, not an every name index. So you do want to think about subjects. I like to look by location. Now there is a section in Percy, I'll go back a screen. You actually can look for surnames, but that's going to be articles about that family with that surname. It's not, so if there's an article about the uh, Skinner family reunion, you could find that but it's not going to find a reference to Henry Skinner that just happens to be mentioned in an article about Perry County tax records. Okay, so think by topic, but with more than 3 million records, I think it's definitely worth looking at. So you get the results and you can either contact the publisher because it gives you all of that information and oftentimes these are published by different genealogy societies, historical societies, and you can often contact those societies and say, hey, I'm interested in a copy of this specific article. Sometimes they'll send it to you just for the, the cost of the copy or a very minimal charge. Sometimes if you are a member of that society, they might have their past periodicals back on you know, a members only website. But going into Percy, you, know, you can kind of see what what they have and it might be a little bit more, um, uh, Percy might be a better index than what that society has. Um, you can, and if, if that doesn't work contacting the publisher, you can order copies directly from the Genealogy Center there at the Allen County Public Library. I do have a video all about using Percy, the periodical source index. So that's also on my YouTube channel. So. If you go over there, you will also find that um, you will also find that um, the video there. Another resource that's been around for quite some time, and that is WorldCat.org. 
it went through a major change earlier this fall. Now, WorldCat.org, WorldCat stands for World Catalog. And kind of like Percy, where you can find things in places that you didn't necessarily expect to find them, it's the same with WorldCat. They have millions and millions of what they call bibliographic records. That's just a fancy way of saying entries in a catalog, but it's for libraries all around the world. But you want to treat WorldCat, again, like a catalog. So sure, you're going to do searches for things like you know, Skinner family or Macmillan family, things like that, but also thinking about topic. So thinking about the name of the church that your ancestors attended or the school that they attended, thinking about just the history of that county, places that they worked, occupations that they held, other topics that would be pertinent to that ancestor, looking them up in WorldCat, and then you can find references to books, periodicals, uh, databases, microfilm, microfiche, um, Database, you know, just basically, if it can be cataloged, you might find it in WorldCat. And what I love about it is, again, the fact that you can turn up some really neat things in places that you never expected to find them. I was doing research, and this has been quite some time ago, doing a little bit of research on the Columbus Buggy Company. In the late 1800s, early 1900s, Columbus, Ohio was the home of the largest concentration of buggy manufacturers. And one of them was called the Columbus Buggy Company. It's like, oh, you know, I'd kind of like to learn a little bit more about them. So I was looking for them in WorldCat and I found, I forget what year, it's like 1908, catalog of the Columbus Buggy Company and it was held in a library in Texas. I would never have looked for a catalog for the Columbus Buggy Company at this library in Texas, but I found it on WorldCat. So this is another resource. Again, it's been around for years and years. If you haven't used it recently, the reason I have this in the recap is because it was updated this fall and they have a new interface. Um, they've changed some ways that the, um, where you can sort of narrow down your search. I think it makes a little bit more sense now. They have better listings of what libraries that particular resource is held in. So if you haven't explored uh, worldcat.org for a while, or if you've never explored it, uh, I really do encourage you to take a look. And I do have a video all about using WorldCat that's also on my YouTube channel. So yeah, those were probably the biggest things that we had coming up in the world of genealogy um, in 2022. I mean, yeah, there were a lot of other, um, a lot of other smaller updates, but we could be talking about updates all night <laughs> if I would try to cover every single update everywhere. And that kind of leads me to a point because it never fails that someone will ask me or I'll, I'll see the question pop up on social media of, hey, what is the best genealogy website? And not to be a smart aleck about it because I really do mean this answer sincerely the best genealogy website is the one that has the answer to the question you're asking. Not every genealogy website is going to have everything that you need. All right. Um, yeah, there is, there is overlap between ancestry and family search. There is overlap between family search and my heritage. There's overlap between my heritage and, you know, what other website, right? So yes, there is overlap, but different websites will have some unique content. There are things on my heritage that are not on Ancestry or FamilySearch. 
Ancestry has unique things. Family Search has unique things. Find My Past has unique things. And here's something else that I really want to encourage everyone to remember going into the new year. As wonderful as the big genealogy websites are, they don't have everything. And I'm not even saying the whole, oh, well, you know, it's not all online. Y'all know that. Okay, I don't, I don't think I need to sit here and tell you that not everything is online. But even the things that are online, they are not all on Ancestry or Family Search or MyHeritage or Find My Past or any other big, quote, genealogy website. Truly, there are countless websites out there that could have the answer that you're looking for. They could unlock that, that key. It could be that, that thing you need to smash down that brick wall. And I'm talking about websites like public libraries, genealogy societies, historical societies, even those little teeny tiny small historical societies that are only open the third Saturday of the month from 10 in the morning to two in the afternoon. Sometimes they have some really neat things on their websites. Are they going to be the biggest, brightest, flashiest, you know, most beautiful, well-designed websites ever? Yeah, probably not. But they are definitely worth looking at. Things like the State Archives, the State Library, their websites. It's amazing the databases and the digital images that are coming available on these other websites. Google can be your friend. Sometimes a good Google search will help you find those things in those unexpected places. So as we go into the new year, which as I'm doing this live stream, the new, the new year will be starting in about two days. Um, as we're going into the new year, think more broadly. Think about, hey, where haven't I looked before? Or, hey, where haven't I looked in a while? Could they have more stuff there? Yeah, I used Percy back in the day, back when, way, way back when it was a database that was hosted on Ancestry, or back when it was on CD-ROM. Yes, I'm a geek. I do have a version of Percy on CD-ROM. Um, if you haven't used it since then, there's more stuff there now. I encourage you to go back and look at it. And even the websites that are familiar. When you have that brick wall problem that you can't quite find the answer to, you can't quite find that thing that's just going to help break those bricks apart. How often do we go back and see what has been added, what new databases have been added to Ancestry or Family Search or MyHeritage or Find My Past. What new, what new database do they have that could give you those answers that you've been looking for? So I encourage you, as you go into the new year, think about that. Think about looking at new places and reviewing those old familiar favorites that we keep going back to over and over. Um, maybe do it a little bit more regularly. <laughs> um, I do want to take a look at the comments. Jennifer says, uh, Family Search Roots Tech is amazing. It looks like they will be continuing the free virtual option. Yes, Roots Tech is coming up in the first weekend of March. I think that's the second through the fourth. Um, I am speaking at Roots Tech in 2023. I'm speaking there in person. So if you're going to be in Salt Lake, I hope to see you there. Registration is currently open both for the in-person option and the free virtual option. You, you, don't, you don't need to register to watch online, at least you didn't last year. Um, but when you register, even for the free option, the free virtual option, 
it does give you a little bit more functionality, like you can go in and create your own playlist, which that can be really handy as you're going through all of these wonderful sessions that you want to watch and you can just add them to your playlist. Like I want to watch this later. I want to watch this later. That way you don't lose track of them. So that's definitely worth looking at. Yeah. And as Chris says, the answers could even be across the ocean. Yeah. Chris, I'm, I'm betting that a lot of yours, a lot of your answers are in Italy. Just a wild guess. I, I know Chris. I know that Chris has a lot of Italian ancestry. And we've we've talked about the research that he's done there. Yeah. Um, oh, thank you, Jennifer. I appreciate that. Well, I tell you, you know, I I feel so fortunate and so blessed to to be able to do this. I I love genealogy. I love family history. I've been doing genealogy. I started, I mean, I was little. I, I wasn't doing research research when I was little, but I was really close with my paternal grandmother. And she was sort of the unofficial family historian, even though she didn't call herself that. But she was the one who kept up the family Bible. She was the one who held the stories. She was the one who labeled the photographs. Yes, she labeled photographs. The woman was a saint, okay? Um, but I was close with her and she told me a lot of the family stories and it just kind of worked its way into my brain that, hey, this is cool. My family has a history. This is really neat. And then as I got older and got married and had kids, and I realized I knew a lot about my dad's side of the family because of grandma, but because of family circumstances, I really didn't know hardly anything at all about my mom's side of the family. So that's really the side of the family I wanted to go discover. And that's when I started the research. And that's when I just fell into this, just head over heels. And I feel so fortunate to be able to share this with everyone to help people make those same kind of discoveries that I've been able to make. And just feeling, feeling like, yeah, my family has a history. I am part of this history. And, and seeing people when they make that connection, that to me is just the neatest, most wonderful thing. I, I can't imagine doing anything else. I just, I really can't really can't. All right. Well, I think that that is going to wrap it up for, uh, for this particular session of genealogy news. I'm going to be doing these more regularly in, in the coming year. Also going to be having a lot more videos just overall. So again, if you are watching this, especially if you are watching this on YouTube, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. So, and if you really want to get notified, also hit that, also hit that little bell that will notify you when I have new videos coming out. So everyone, again, thank you for joining me. I appreciate you being here. Stay safe, stay healthy, and make some great discoveries in your family history. And we'll catch you next time. Bye-bye.